Hi friends, it's Jennifer Swales from Honeybee Astrology back to talk about the Aries full moon happening on October 17, 2024. This full moon is occurring at 22 degrees of Aries and it is conjunct Chiron and it's also squaring Mars and Cancer. Holy shnikes, it's going to be a good one, but it's going to be really important to kind of see where you are now that Pluto has turned direct. Before I get into it, I'm so excited. I want to thank everyone for liking and sharing and subscribing. It really does mean quite a lot. Um, I don't want to get into all of that kind of personal thing, but it, it is truly motivating to see that people um, respond to my work. So thank you. So here we are in Aries. Aries is the first sign of the zodiac, right? It is primal, so it's ruled by Mars, as is Scorpio, and we're going to talk about how like signs have like objectives, signs with the same ruler. But for right now, the moon, as of now, is just about, kind of, uh, I think it's about eight degrees into Aries right now, but when I thought about doing this video yesterday when the moon was in Pisces, it would have been such a different video because Pisces is ruled by Jupiter and with Jupiter and Gemini retrograde, everyone's thinking can be very scattered, right? Because Jupiter ultimately is the principle of order. And in Gemini, it's really hard to make a kind of order uh, because it's always new information coming in. Gemini allows us to combine different things and think outside the box for new solutions. So it can be ever expansive with Jupiter there. But now that Jupiter is retrograde, we're asked to go inside and think about our own past history and our own understanding of the self for the wisdom, for the order, to see your kind of patterns in modus operandi, if you will, particularly as a younger person. Aries is the sign of youthfulness because it is the seed bursting forth from the ground. It is the baby. It's the, it's the primal need to survive. But Aries is, the, is ruled by Mars. And Mars is not just the god of war. He is the god of hand-to-hand -hand combat, meaning that his sons are terror and fear. Right? Those are his sons who do his bidding. And so when you think about that, Mars really kicks in or we're in a situation when we're dealing with our own internal Mars, when we're talking about fight, flight, freeze, or fawn, when we're talking about really any situation that intimidates us. And so because it does feel like a life or death situation and we're talking about people who are in close proximity to you, right? Hand-to-hand -hand combat. So very often Mars isn't necessarily like, yes, it's war on the grand scale, but it doesn't, it doesn't hit home the way it does when we kind of see Mars in the people around us. And that's really what we should be focusing on because it is very personal right now. Because with Mars in Cancer, the sign of the moon, the sign of the mother, we're talking about things that are kind of ancestral, yes, but are also kind of of this life, of the immediacy. The moon rules the day, right? It, it, the moon shines its light <clears throat> on things that we don't necessarily see. <coughs> Excuse me. And so with Mars there, we can feel the fear and not necessarily understand from whence it's coming from because it might be coming somewhere deep in the recesses of our subconscious. <laughs> I've been thinking quite a lot about uh, Marion Wood, Woodman and her notion about loving from the heart. When we can get out of the ego, when we can put the ego aside, only then can we start to love from the heart, which is Leo, right? Leo, where the sun is rules, the sun is exalted in Aries. So the sun, this full moon, because it's shining the light of the Libra sun, it's emphasizing how we, how much we need partnership, but also how we need to be one half of the partnership. And so we really can't talk about Aries without talking about Libra or Taurus, right? Because Taurus is right next door. They are two sides of the same coin because this is Mars. 
and this is Venus, and they really do work together. And so, where is Venus now? Venus is in the end degrees of Scorpio, so within a day, she's going to move into Sagittarius. Right now, she's she's in the sign opposite from her rulership, Taurus, where she is the earthly Aphrodite. That's how Plato put it. Where we're, she's involved with the senses and making things beautiful in the t in the earth element, right? Spending time, uh, talking, enjoying beautiful things together, enjoying the kind of gracefulness of being together, right? That's what Taurus is. But in Scorpio, she's in the domain of Mars. This is the Mars ruled water sign. So this really got me thinking about, uh, I'm always thinking about Venus and Mars together because to my mind, they are together. But it made me think about the Venus in, in Mars in Hephaestus, right? The Aphrodite in Aries in Hephaestus. Meaning that Mars is the sun born to Juno and um, uh, Zeus, right? Um, and he's despised by them both. Uh, they, all of the gods hate Mars because no one can conquer Mars, right? In, other than Venus. Only Venus can kind of disarm Mars. But Mars comes, you know, Mars appears as a dark cloud. So you can kind of feel Mars coming. It is kind of the the foreshadowing of danger, of violence, right? And so you have to think about kind of what is your relationship to those uh, emotions with Mars and Cancer, right? Cancer being, um, this is what I need to survive, this is what I love, and this is what I'll die without. That's what Cancer is, right? If I don't have this, I cannot thrive, I cannot survive. This is why you know, cancer rules the stomach. So when you say like, oh, I love that restaurant, right? I, oh, I love that. We had such a good time there. We went there for blah, blah, blah. And oh my God, the cake was gorgeous and la, la, la. We're talking about all of the kind of aesthetic, sensual virtues that are alive in Taurus because Taurus is where the moon is exalted, right? So with, with Mars being in Cancer, we're talking about thinking about our past, thinking about kind of the um, environments upon which we were born. And because, you know, so often we see people who kind of marry their mothers or marry their, their fathers, right? So I want to talk a little bit about Venus and Mars in particular uh, through the lens of Carl Jung, right? So when we're talking about the masculine, it usually presents itself, the animus, right? The animus in a, a, a woman it means the kind of masculine energy which she uh, has, but is also trying to cultivate, right? How can the feminine be more kind of empowered, right? Because we see the masculine energy, the energy of the sun, right? Rationality, Aries is where the sun is exalted. It's the first sign of the zodiac. So rationality, kind of cool thinking, a sense of purpose, a sense of uh, prophecy about where you know where you're going. Aries is the divine spark of creation. It's the fire. All of the fire points in our chart are kind of where we direct our internal fire to kind of reach our highest potential that we came into this incarnation with, right? Like, think about when you're lying in bed uh, in the morning and you're kind of in that sleeping state where you're trying to kind of recapture the last, um, the wrap up of the dream, right? I, I want the kind of golden moment. I want the beautiful sunset of the movie where they kiss or whatever the dream is, right? It's usually kind of at the end. And so we're kind of grasping for that potential of what is the unconscious telling me but all the while we're getting pulled into the kind of known, into the, the spark of this is the day. That's very much Aries, right? Uh, this is the moment of my life. I'm alive right now. And so we spring out of bed with a purpose, right? So usually my purpose is to make sure that my son gets out of bed, but you know, it's a motivating factor. And that is Mars, right? It, and so, it, and also I have to be ready for combat at that point, right? Because 
I'm taking a stance. I want you to move towards my will or direct your will in the way I'm wanting to go. So inherently in that scenario, I, the Aries, am squaring Cancer, my need to be his mother, right? And also his need as the masculine to have a mother. <laughs> so that's the difference between Pisces where everything is possible. And, and we have an inkling of what the kind of unseen forces are trying to compel us towards and then it bursts through with Aries. But Aries says Chiron is there. There is a wounded part of us, which is the human part of us, that says, I can't do it. I'm not good enough, right? It is the kind of the feeling of being almost like Hephaestus, being born lame. Hephaestus was born to um, Zeus and Hera but he was crippled, deformed from birth. And so um, Hera, Juno, tossed him from Mount Olympus. And so he always has the, the feeling of being kind of outcast and disregarded. But uh, Hephaestus is also the painter, patron of uh, the workers, um, not workers in the field, that's Saturn. Workers of crafts, people who work with their hands, who kind of overcome their own physical uh, limitations to specialize in something necessary and gorgeous, right? But Hephaestus lives deep down in the caves um, as a kind of deserted, abandoned person. So we can see how we can go from Aries, from Mars, from having all that strength and vim, vig, vim and vigor, right? In the hand-to-hand -hand combat. And then the flip side of Hephaestus being forced to, to kind of live in this perennial shame of being the kind of forsaken son and also the cuckolded husband, right? This is the, the feeling that, you know, I have a girlfriend, but she's always got wandering eyes. She, she could be the most truthful. It's, it's the innate uh, fear of the masculine in, in, into which we are all born, right? Females have this too. We know that that exists in the masculine. But when we think about the, about the female, about the divine feminine, we're talking about, you know, the anima for women, uh, for men, right? That's the, the, the feminine aspects of themselves that they're trying to kind of reincorporate. So here we have Eve, the ultimate temptress, right? Uh, the person who kind of seduced um, Adam into the first sin, right? The, the reason for the fall is Eve. And so we have the feminine um, being the kind of focal point of blame. Is that what you experienced, right? Is that what you're kind of living with now where you're c carrying all of the blame and shame? See how this Eve can be tied directly to Scorpio, which, was, which is Mars ruled, right? The Mars feeling sign where we can kind of always feel punished for not feeling good, not being good enough, or for having led the person astray. And that, that archetype continues into the next elevation of it, which is Helen, right? This beautiful um, wife, <coughs> excuse me, of Menelaus, uh, the most beautiful woman in the world, right? The prize, the trophy, how many kind of women feel that they need to be this or that men need to have this. I need a beautiful wife. I need that status symbol, right? But, you know, from the feminine perspective, uh, Helen is a pawn, right? She was promised. She's the reason for the Trojan War. Not, no, of course she isn't. It, it was the, it was um, Aphrodite herself promising uh, Paris that he would give her she would give him the most beautiful woman in the world if he gave her the golden apple. He was chosen because of his naivete. He was seen as a shepherd, right? But he was still a man and he still had kind of simple desires for beauty. And so in this character of Helen, we have the kind of pariah um, for which we see men kind of battling or competing but also to not really a, a, an actualized person, right? Just a, just either a trophy or an excuse. Um, always the outcast and always separate from all other women because she was kind of raised up. It creates, again, more kind of envy and covetousness, 
which is associated with Scorpio as well, right? So from Helen, we go to Mary, to the Virgin Mother, right? Who is, um, I suppose, the kind of best feminine envoy of the of the uh, will of God, right? Um, to be a, a mortal and yet raised up, but not sexualized, right? So now we see the kind of evolution of the uh, Madonna and the whore, right? How we can we can how can women only be one or the other, right? And then we come into this last, but Mary also knows from the get, she has to give her son to death, right? And this is what all mothers know. I will, I will give you this life, but it, it's filled with suffering, right? And I'm choosing to bring you here and inevitably you will die and I will die. I will abandon you, right? So from this part of the feminine archetype, we see kind of the masculines um, being conflicted with uh, the feminine for sure, but also with their with their mother, right? With their mother and their, we'll get to the father, but with their mother, because you have to kind of separate yourself from your mother in order to individuate. All men do, right? You have you can't be in love with the mother. You can't be under the guise of your mother because your mother is not a partner she's your mother and so you're making choices based on the kind of idealized understanding of who your mother is which isn't actually of a, a, a human person right who who desires and who has needs and wants and strives so from there from mary we go to sophia which is kind of the cultivation of wisdom not just of all of the feminine energy, but also this knowing that of the fallenness of being a human, that we are divine entities who chose to incarnate. We did choose to fall. It kind of goes full circle back to Eve, right? That we did choose this because everything, every lesson, every Aries experience and Virgo wisdom, right? Virgo wisdom, sixth house. Cre um, multiplies the wisdom and experience of God, right? And every time we strive for love, for the higher understanding of anything, it increases the kind of exponential growth of those uh, energies. So men are kind of inherently dealing with a lot of feminine issues, right? And so this is how they're wrestling with how they kind of perceive the women in their world subconsciously but subconsciously women are wrestling as well we're wrestling with the same kind of you know uh madonna whore right we're, we're wrestling with mars versus saturn okay so if we think about mars as being the warrior one who fights one who strives one who will keep me safe one who does excel in hand-to-hand -hand combat one with whom I can procreate for the best. I mean, that's a biological imperative. So all women have that. It's unconscious, just as the Eve is unconscious. And then we go on to the hero or the poet. So this becomes the person who can perform, right? This isn't just a warrior, a person who will be cannon fodder, right? Um, this is a person who will excel on the battlefield. This is the man in the arena, that Theodore Roosevelt quote, right? And so we're looking for excellence. We're looking for a person who can kind of see the conflict inherent in everyday life and elevate it to a more kind of Venusian, artful ideal, right? Then we're, so these are the kind of two polarities of Mars, right? Where you can take the kind of suffering of the soldier and bring it into the hell realms of Scorpio, bring it down deep into the kind of angst and, and, and the sadness and the pain and the, and the confusion and the abandonment of what it is just to be a creature who needs others to survive, right? Libra. But also who can transcend that and elevate the experience into something worth celebrating, right? to get the victory out of, get the triumph out of the tragedy. Then we come to the per, the professor or the clergy, right? This is the Hierophant and the Tarot. This is kind of uh, the church. 
This is the kind of ideal, idealizing of the, of the contract, right? Or of the higher wisdom. And so it's very interesting when you think about this. And I think that this is kind of where we are right now with Pluto being at the last degree of Capricorn. Because Capricorn is about, yes, the status quo, but it, and also, uh, you know, maintaining our structures, you know, church and state and government and all these things. But it's also about kind of codifying um, people's behaviors or the behavior of society, right? And so when we get into this domain, we have to kind of think about, in particular, because we have Pluto going into Aquarius. Pluto into Aquarius, or was it Saturn? Was it Saturn squaring Uranus? I think it might be Saturn squaring Uranus last year, which was the um, angle. It was the uh, rub. It was the friction, right? Uh, which created the Protestant Reformation, right? And so what does the Protestant Reformation do? When Martin Luther kind of nailed his laws to the church wall, to the church, church door, what he was saying was, the common man does not need an intermediary between myself and God, right? That I am a kind of evolution. I can access the wisdom and knowledge that is in the Bible, right? And this, along with the, right, this is Uranus squaring Saturn, uh, when Saturn was in um, Aquarius. This was the kind of need for reform, because that's what Aquarius is about, in revolution but also to the way that we live on a daily basis, Taurus, right? The way that we experience our lives. You know, the moon is exalted here and how we feel about it. So when we kind of went from feeling that we needed a kind of a priest or a, a rabbi or how, whatever you wanted to call the Hierophant as an intermediary between ourselves and God, when we kind of removed that, we gained an awful lot of kind of personal power, but we also simultaneously moved closer to the divine, but also made it our responsibility to remain close to the divine. And so now we come into what James Hillman kind of equates as economics, right? He, uh, in one of his talks, he, he, he talks about economics being the kind of um, uh, result of the Protestant Reformation, meaning that when the sky was the limit and you could earn as much as you wanted or you could kind of rise as much as you could based on your own um, efficacy, but also your own value system, right? Um, this is where we get this kind of uh, lack of the spark of the divinity, Right? Uh, this is what Nietzsche said, uh, God is dead and we have killed him and the streets will run red, right? Because we've lost our our spark, uh, our creative spark to the divine. We lost our conduit. It used to be in somebody else's hands, but now it's in our hands. And so how often are we kind of really pursuing that, right? And that's, a, that's Saturn, right? Are we repressing our need to, to connect to something that's greater than ourselves, right? With the, with Uranus having moved into Taurus, this is kind of the, the reclaiming of the natural world, right? I mean, never has it been more in the forefront of people's minds that um, we're in the throes of a kind of environmental crisis on our planet. And you can see it now with the extremes and the weather, right? This will kind of be more brought to the forefront as soon as Pluto moves into Aquarius and we really start reforming, right? Revolution, evolution. But right now we're still contending in this Pluto and Capricorn Hierophant, right? Are we going to listen to our better angels? Particularly as we're coming here in the US, we're coming into an election where we're really being asked. And this is why this Mars retrograde is going to be so important because it's gonna cut out this bullshit of the Hierophant and really make it, I suppose, clear, plainly understood that you live the, her, the virtues of the Hierophant, right? You bring that home every single day and you subject your family to it, 
right? And also too, when he moves into Leo, when Mars moves into Leo, it's going to be, are you living up to your responsibilities to be the king, to be the divine masculine, right? To be the one who provides for the people in your world. Are you living up to your fullest potential of strength, of, of rationality and prophecy, right? This Mars retrograde is going to hammer home the notion that however you are dealing with the feminine inside of you for the masculine, and however you are dealing with the masculine inside of you as, as a feminine, right? Because here we can get into this notion of with the warrior in the, in the hero poet, when we kind of idealize, um, our fathers, right? Uh, Jung said that uh, women look at uh, who are struggling with their animus can uh, look at their fathers as this kind of long lost person, right? The uh, the absent father, which can be the hierophant and the divine masculine, where you idealize that person and you say, yeah. well, you know, my dad had to work so hard, blah, 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 and I never really saw him and I really don't know him and we never spent time daily time, right? Cancer, the moon, every single day. We never spent time together, but no one's ever going to be as good as my dad, right? He's this kind of idealized masculine that can never be achieved, which is unrequited love because you're cultivating a love and yet not sharing it with the actual people in your world, right? Or we can have this kind of demon lover. Let's say your father was, uh, a person who was a volatile person, right? And so you might want the removed. It, that might have been too dangerous for you. And you might seek out the kind of avoidant, um, un, emotionally unavailable man because that feels safer, sadder, right? Or you might, you might get involved with a demon lover, meaning a person that, oh, if only that person could beat X, Y, and Z, they'd be the perfect person. And I love them. And when they do this, and I never feel as good because it's kind of like dating a, a slot machine, right? You never know what you're going to get, right? Are you going to get a loser, the warrior, the cannon fodder? Or are you going to get the hero? Or are they going to just keep moving back and forth between these two swings of the priority of a person? Excuse me. So this is what we're inherently dealing with. And this Mars retrograde in Cancer is going and Leo is going to show us not just how we ourselves um, deal with our masculine and feminine issues, but where we inherited them, right? Where where they came from, our mothers and our fathers, and how much of it is subconscious. So right now, excuse me, for this Aries full moon with Chiron, but this is the Chiron that was eclipsed last year. Um, in the in the initial set of Aries Libra eclipses, the, the the nodal axis is about to shift into Pisces and Virgo. Okay, so um, if you feel out of control now with the North Node being in Aries, what will you feel like when it moves into every element swirling around and within you, which is Pisces? Okay, so this this is the gift of this time and the gift of the universe is that. October 18th, right? We have Venus having gone through Scorpio. So we've been in the hell realms and you've really been asked to kind of look at like, how do you use your feminine energies to create kind of gracefulness in a situation which is naturally discordant, right? And we can do this like, and I have found myself very tempted to, to engage in gossip and I have really tried to withhold. And I felt myself jumping to conclusions the other day. And I really wanted to get into it with another person about another person. And I had to say, wait, think about what you're doing. Mars is in Cancer, right? This is going to have ramifications for how you feel in the long term. They're going to play out from now until the spring. Hold back. Can you control yourself in your will? right? What is motivating you in this situation? But the minute that Venus steps into Sag, she's going to be back in touch with fire, right? She's going to be more energized to go get it, right? Get it. 
she's going to be coming into an opposition with Jupiter, right? So we're going to have more of a kind of glimpse of how our, our past patterns of order and what we want to go towards now, right? What we need more in terms of our mental stimulation and our physical stimulation. How do we, how do we cultivate the spark, the, the, the divine spark of intuition within us? Okay. Saturn is going, Saturn is in Pisces. I didn't put him there, but he, he's very much there. And he's going to go direct on November 15th. So that gives us like less than a month to really kind of understand that we are the, the bottom line of our lives, right? We don't live the outer planets. We're definitely get affected by them, but we don't harness their energy in the sense that in the same way in which we can harness the, the energy of Saturn in Jupiter. Jupiter being the kind of ultimate manifestation of what you could be, of wisdom and order in your life. And Saturn also being the ultimate of kind of fairness and, and truth, right? And, and future thinking for um, your, uh, your family, for everything that has come before you and everything that will come after, right? It, it will solidify your place in this world in an energetic sense, at the very least, right? But with Saturn, you know, the bottom line is for right now, the, the kind of voice of authority or the kind of chastising voice or the voice that represses you, however you see your Saturn, it's internal right now. It will go external. So we'll have new kind of bosses to answer to. And that's in a month, right? And then with, and then, Mars is going to sextile um, Uranus on the 24th. So for right now, as we come into the full moon, a full moon is always the sun in Libra standing directly across from the moon in Aries. So you might see uh, more volatility in women. You might see more volatility in weather, right? You might see more combativeness. Where do people need to defend themselves more? Where has that chironic wound not been um, adequately addressed, right? If you can't, with Mars being in Cancer, in all of the masculine energies within the women and within the men are struggling to kind of reconcile what they receive in the emotional state. Right, so my son was playing football and he was doing really great and he was really loving it and he was c clicking with his teammates and feeling part of something new and it was very invigorating and then he got hurt, right? And so now he's really wrestling with that sense of, does he really belong? Can he really kind of come back? How? What is this waiting period? We're all kind of, if you think about life as really being kind of in the waiting room of life or being in the airport waiting to get on the flight of life, you see how life, how time is just staggeringly boring sometimes and how, yeah, it can be really fun and distracting to kind of get into these lower energetic states, right? And to live there makes more drama, makes for more excitement. But we want to kind of always be elevating towards the Sophia, understanding that as the feminine, we are divine, right? And that it's the wisdom of being incarnated and, to, and having achieved that sense of ourselves as a divine creature. That is the gift, right? That we impart to others through our graciousness, through our ability to love. And for the, for the masculine, he's always moving into the divine masculine, which is the balancing partner, right? It's not uh, the divine masculine period. It is the equal partner to the divine feminine. This is the symbol of Libra, right? Where we, rather than staying, you know, parallel to each other in this human existence, we go off the path and then we come back to the divine existence, right? And we struggle. This is what life is. But the, the wisdom of how to kind of take what we have received and to incorporate that in, into the knowledge and to teaching, right? Because Capricorn is the sign of the Hierophant, Taurus. These are, these, 
well, Taurus is the sign of the Hierophant, but really when you think about the status quo of the church, these are all kind of, this is a receptive sign. This is a, Capricorn is a feminine sign. So really it is the wisdom of how to convert the lessons that we've learned into the kind of greater value for humanity, right? So in that sense, the, the divine feminine steps into wisdom and the divine masculine steps into kind of restraint, right? Where we always think about men as having to go get it, get it, right? We have both of these kind of energies always working and how they show up and where they kind of play their, their games. That depends on your birth chart, right? But for this full moon, please do understand that this is a really kind of a lull, an energetic lull for us to kind of get right within ourselves before things start to speed up. Because Mars is going to oppose Pluto on November 3rd. Mars is going to oppose Pluto and Capricorn. On, so we're going to have a kind of final challenge of our understanding of the feminine and the, and the masculine and how that plays out in our world. Can you see how your kind of culture maybe created this understanding of your parents, right? And how it's really not a fair assessment. And how can you see that living in this kind of Saturnian way of kind of being the masculine deprives you from the Mars, right? Removes you from the kind of necessary physical um, embodiment of your life, right? It's not just a kind of academic uh, enterprise. It, you're, we're embodied creatures, right? There has to be love. There has to be passion. There cannot be a Mars without a Venus, right? Because then you're going into degradation. Then you're going into the lower octaves, into the shadow. The last thing I'll say before I go through all of the signs is when we think about the zodiac, right? I think of this zodiac as everything that we are. We are the zodiac. We are the self, right? So if you thought about it in terms of the way Carl Jung does it, that you, this is all of yourself. You have all of the, this energy working within you. And the better you understand how the planets and the houses relate to each other, the more you will ultimately understand yourself. And so you can be better in relationship, right? Well, think about this line. See this line. This We call this the axis, right? The first through seventh axis and then the fourth through the tenth axis. This is the axis of our lived existence, right? Think about like the flat. You're on the ground, right? Ground level. All of this is unconscious, right? And all of this is conscious. This is the part we see of people's lives, the top part of their chart. We don't see the underneath of their chart, but if you just see yourself as the chart and you understand that this little thin line is your ego, it's just this tiny little paper thin thing that's always being kind of added to and subtracted from, and the unconscious are the archetypes, meaning that I don't have to show up as the warrior every day. It lives in my subconscious, right? It lives in my unconscious and in the collective unconscious. When my ego is tweaked, I can go into the warrior. I can go into the mother. I can go into the crone. They are all in me, right? As well as the, the shadow, right? As well as the demon. We have all of it within us. And so the more you understand, I suppose, how your planets and your houses and your patterns, right? Jupiter, order, how you kind of prioritize different environments and how you show up and how these archetypes have played out in your life and get a much better handle on them. That's the North Node in Aries. Know thyself. To thine own self be true, but ultimately understand that you are kind of at war in this life, right? For every person, if you just go by the notion of the zodiac and Aries being the first sign, being the spark of creation, well, the eighth house is Scorpio. And Scorpio is the house of transformation, meaning that we're always kind of fighting with life in some way, shape, or form. You could be an eighth house person like me, and you're always fighting with life. I'm always fighting with myself, right? 
And so I have to be really mindful of not bringing the fight outside of my world, of, outside of myself, to kind of transforming my own understanding of what the situation is calling for. And, and this Chiron, this the, the eclipse last year really gave me the kind of sense of take a pause, take a breath. When people are saying that I'm making them feel X, Y, and Z, positively or negatively, I have to take a breath and understand that happiness is an inside job for them. I might be contributing to it or provoking it in some way, but all of the responsibility for how you feel is not on me. That is the lesson of the eighth house, and that's the understanding. All of what you inherited from your parents is not yours. Put some of it down and reclaim your own power. I know this was a little bit of everything everywhere all at once, but we're in a really dynamic time and we have huge energies playing out and we're in a transition between Pluto and Capricorn and Pluto and Aquarius and it's gonna happen in less than two months. So although we're always in the kind of, you know, lobby of the airport waiting to get on the plane, we're about to get on the plane. And 2025 is the takeoff, right? Because we're gonna have, by the time of the new moon in Aries, just six months from now, two days later after that new moon, we're gonna have Neptune step into Aries. That's gonna be massive. And that's going to speak more to this notion of how do you relate to the divine? How do you cultivate your understanding of the divine? For right now, whatever Venus is showing you in Scorpio, because she is in a trine, right? She's been in a trine with uh, Neptune and Pisces. Whatever kind of illusions or disillusionment is coming up for you, see it as the gift that it is. Because when we uh, make our dreams real, there's always going to be something that's not perfect about it, right? It's never going to be ideal. It's never going to be the dream that was inside of our head. But it will be real. It will be the life that we're living. It will be our lived experience. It will be Mars. And we're going to have to fight to keep it. Okay, so it's a very exciting time. So I'm going to talk about um, this. This is a full moon, right? This is a, a, a the fullest culmination of the energy, but not just of this lunar cycle, really since last year from the eclipses, right? So think about how much have you individuated from your uh, familial history, from your understanding of what the government means to me and how do I keep myself safe on a daily basis, right? How have I maintained my safety? How do you think about how you use information with Jupiter there, right? Are you a kind of constantly looking and searching for the next the next thing to make you, I suppose, uh, clearer or uh, more insightful? Or can you use your own kind of past experience to see the bigger picture so that you can kind of change your philosophy of life and tap more into the spark that is divinely you? And also, how, do you, how are you dealing with your emotional control issues, right? Taurus, Scorpio. How are you using, how are you being in service to others? Virgo, Pisces. And, or how much are you kind of getting lost in the sauce of woe is me and everything's a mess and it's all too much? How are you stepping into your divine power of Leo and, and, and owning your joy? Remembering that happiness is an inside job and it really doesn't come from other people. Other people are as far away from you as, you know, Pluto. <laughs> we don't understand them. We never will, no matter how much I could tell you everything about myself, you would never understand me because I'm a mystery to myself, right? And when you think about your own life that way and you see it as an adventure and you see all of these things playing out with you, you have more tools to work with. And that's all that's going on because Mars really is hand-to-hand -hand combat. It really is the primary kind of source information in your life. And the better you can kind of use pause time to take a break and not become emotionally overloaded, right? And not be kind of pulled into um, situations of the past with cancer, of nostalgia, because it feels comfortable. Then we're able to kind of cultivate and grow we're always growing, we're always building, right? Saturn doesn't stop and, and our time doesn't stop, right? So we're always growing ourselves. 
And when we see ourselves that way, then we can kind of manifest our best Saturn. I hope that this helps. I'm Jennifer Swales from Honeybee Astrology, and I'm going to go through the 12 signs now. Aries. If you are an Aries, then this full moon is all about you and all about how you relate to other people, right? And as an Aries, it can be, right, right in the head. I understand I'm an Aries as well, right? And it can be, it can feel like everything's on my shoulders and that I need to be the one that fights the good fight and that I have to kind of defend myself and my principles always. But with the South Node and Libra, you know, we've been kind of being exposed to patterns where we maybe may, maybe have been living in these lower octaves of what we've been subjecting each other to, right? And maybe I've been treating you kind of as this lesser incarnation of Mars to see you as a villain, right? The demon to my to myself, to, to myself as the protagonist. How can we stop doing that? How can we recognize that whatever the other person is showing us is really a reflection of ourselves? It's going to be challenging. With This is a, a T-square. So it's going to come out in terms of emotional anger, right? Or overwhelming emotions that make us angry, right? But it, it, it's absolutely for our benefit, better, benefit, benef, betterment, benefit. But also, too, it's to help us kind of improve our lives on the daily basis and the minute-to-minute -minute basis because it's going to give us more kind of control of ourselves. Taurus, if this new, if you are a Taurus, then this new moon is happening in your 12th house. So the 12th house is the house of a self undoing, meaning that you have a pattern of living, a way of being in this world, which is undoubtedly motivated by your family of origin, which would be Leo, right? The pridefulness, the kind of this is the way things are done in this family, right? The square to Leo. And then from that square to Leo, we go uh, into the eighth house and, and we we can access the, the wisdom of Sagittarius, okay? So it's a way for our Taurus is to kind of tap into an element that isn't nat nat natural to them, right? Fire. If we don't kind of see our fire and our Aries fire in particular as being the self undoing when we don't understand ourselves, remember these are subconscious signs. They we develop our patterns of Aries and Taurus from birth, and they keep us alive. But they they also become the kind of security that can kind of be our our killing zone. Our comfort zone becomes our killing zone. But when you can see the tension of how am I in this world? Well, I, I learned it in Leo from my family of origin. Then you can take it into the wisdom of the higher mind of the ninth house of, well, there's been a lot of times when then that necessarily didn't happen, that I had faith in myself or I had faith in others or something came through for me, Sagittarius, right? And we can see the bigger picture of how our lives have played out. Maybe I don't need to control everything. Maybe I don't need to to hold back and restrain myself when I really should be getting going. There are times when we are blessed. How can I kind of see that pattern? Take that into my kind of sense of order in my life, in my daily existence, siblings, cousins, neighbors. It starts, it starts in the homestead, right? Or excuse me, second house of earned income, right? You have Jupiter there. So how have you seen that your hard work, of course, contributes to your self-worth and value, but that also you've had quite a hand of luck, right? And that luck continues because it shines on you in Aries. And how can you break down these patterns of doing into, so that it becomes self-undoing, right? The 12th house, we, we always see it as a hidden house, but it's kind of like, going to the ashram to get the wisdom of your own self in your own kind of methodology of living. And it's a chance for the Taurus to kind of get back in touch with that divine spark that seems so far away when we're trying to deal with control issues, which ultimately all, in self-worth and value, which ultimately all Tauruses are. I hope that this helps. 
Uh, Gemini, if you are a Gemini, then this Aries full moon is happening for you in your 11th house. So for Geminis, um, the 11th house is the, the friendships that you've made through work, uh, groups, associations, but it's also the kind of largesse that you get from your career, right? It's the payout house. It's the jackpot house, which can also be the house of our greatest fears, right? Because we can lose that. We can, we can win the lottery and we can lose it just as quick if we don't understand who we are, right? With Chiron there, somehow this kind of environment that you've cultivated as your um, support system, right? There's a woundedness feeling there that you're somehow separate from it or that it doesn't serve you or it kind of tweaks a, a part of you that needs more healing. Hopefully that will have been addressed through this last year, but it, it never goes away. It's Chiron. It's the, it's the path to kind of immortality. Look at it like that, right? When you can become vulnerable. For Gemini's, Scorpio is the sixth house. You live there every day, right? This is the work that you do on a daily basis. This is the grind. And it can be very cynical. And you can kind of get into that Hephaestus mentality of, I'm the abandoned child and I'm, I'm the cuckolded husband and nothing I do matters, right? And you can bring that into Capricorn, into the eighth house uh, and become this kind of removed, um, unrequited love figure to your partner, okay? That's the dynamics that are playing out right now. But you have a chance to change that when you change your mind and it all starts with your understanding of your own fire, how do you fight, right? How do you fight yourself and how do you fight others? And how much do you understand that you need love just as much? You cannot live in the rational mind. You have to kind of live the embodied meat suit experience that we are here to receive. I hope that this helps. Cancer, if you are a Cancer, then this Aries full moon is happening in your 10th house, the top of your chart. So there's always a price to be paid here. And that's a very difficult thing, right? For cancers, because your seventh house of partnership is Capricorn. You have been driven for the last 15 years to kind of work with others and to achieve. But um, this can kind of create this real fear right now with Pluto about to go into Aquarius. And so how are you managing that fear? Have you kind of established a, a structure or a partnership that has become stifling or limiting or unrequited, right? It's time to ask yourself that. Where do you need to kind of step into your life as the warrior and kind of get into hand-to-hand -hand combat and to, and to be willing to fight? This is a very difficult place for um, cancers because your fifth house is Scorpio, right? Where those fears live and they can, you can really have a carnival there. Um, you're already so motivated by being safe and by honoring the traditions of the past. It, it's time for you to kind of break out of that. And so see your past patterns in the last 15 years as being inherently unfair to you. And how can you take steps to, to kind of own your own power and, and be willing to say, I need more, a more visceral experience, or I want the quality of my life to be inherently, if I'm going to pay this price of being alone, of being the kind of entrepreneur, or being the person who works with a visionary, right? Uh, the kind of um, unheralded hero, right? Is that worth it to you? Or do you need to step more into your power to become the hero and the poet. Now's the time because you really, with Pluto moving into your eighth house, there could be abundance of riches and wealth there for you. But it really starts for sure with this uh, Mars retrograde that's happening. But it, it, ha it starts now. We're not in the retrograde yet. So you have the benefit of time, Cancer. And, and for cancers, you know, you can feel so with Mercury being your 12th house, your moods can be mercurial. You can change so quickly. But when you understand how to self-soothe, when you understand how to meet your own needs for safety and stability and security and love.
that happiness is ultimately an inside job. Then you can take it to the structures in your life and that it's not so heavy of a price to pay to step into your true power. I hope that this helps. Leo, if you are a Leo, then this Aries full moon is happening in your ninth house. So as a Leo, you're kind of this Pluto in Capricorn has been moving through your sixth house for 15, almost 16 years. And so it can feel like you've kind of lost your spark of divinity to the grind, right? And that other people, particularly in partnership, are as far away and distant as they ever could be, right? And it might have felt that way. But Pluto is saying, you can transform this, right? When you, when you own your own joy, Leo, right? When you understand kind of how the divine is always working for you. And this is a tricky thing for Leos because Leos like to, they take all the responsibility for sure, but they also take all the credit too. And so with this Aries, um, with this Aries full moon happening in the ninth house, where can you see that? Like in the myths, like in the, you know, in the, the Trojan War, uh, they had there were gods who were lined up on the side of the Trojans, particularly Aphrodite, right? And Ares, her lover, because she, that was her side, and he was going to be there, right? He, they are each other's ride or die, and they would intervene for the Trojans, right? How have others intervened for you, or how have you been called to kind of divinely intervene for something greater than yourself? Right? And, and, and in that sense, be able to, to retouch your personal spark of divinity, right? To kind of reinvigorate the fire that can, can feel so burdenous to Leos, right? That there's, you're serving something ultimately greater than yourself. And so the, the more you start to kind of carve out that path to the divinity, the more kind of prepared you will be for 2025 for sure, but also too when Pluto steps into your seventh house. I hope that this helps. Uh, Virgo, if you are a Virgo, then this uh, Aries full moon is happening in your eighth house. So this is the eighth house of transformation. So as a Virgo, you probably are always fighting with life to a certain extent because you pro it probably feels like it's too terrifying to not master something, right? To not, your self-worth and value is, is kind of being there for other people, Libra. And so to step into your own authentic self is probably pretty terrifying as a Virgo, right? Virgos don't like to do anything that they're not masterful with. So now it's time to kind of turn your attention to yourself and how has your relationship with your parents, with your mother, maybe an idealized mother, right? Maybe something here, rather than seeing your mother as here, right? Has, has created a stance for you with cancer being the 11th house of wishes and dreams and fears. How have you maybe kind of suppressed that masculine drive, that 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 hand-to-hand -hand combat as, as being too terrifying uh, to live with? And how do you need to kind of incorporate more of that spark of divinity and fight for your right to live as yourself in whatever manner or form that exists in? It's been very difficult. Well, it's been a blessing, actually, this Capricorn going through the fifth house, because you've really been kind of been being shown, particularly through the workplace or through children or creative projects, with the fifth house, with Pluto in the fifth house for the last 15, 16 years. One, how your time here is limited, and so your self-expression is limited by time, but also by fear, right? Because Capricorn's been squaring that eighth house of Aries. And so how can you own more of yourself rather than giving yourself away in service? How can you take back this masculine energy within yourself so that you're not being pigeonholed in this divine feminine energy or vice versa if you are the masculine, right? How can you own more of this wisdom of yourself as a divine creature, right? Meant to kind of take, Virgo is a receptive sign, take all that has been given to you 
Take all that has been subjected to you and, and transform that into the wisdom of, well, it didn't kill me, it's made me stronger, and I know kind of what skills and abilities I bring to war every day with myself. And to take on that kind of responsibility of the eighth house. The eighth house is the only house where we are transforming. And, but for you in Aries, you're always initiating things. Every time you reach out to a friend, Libra, or a colleague, or do work, you're always initiating, initiating a transformation of your understanding of yourself. That's why the Aries and Virgo axis is so important. Because Aries is experience, but Virgo is wisdom. So how can you take the experience that didn't kill you and made you, but made you stronger and be able to share that as wisdom for others in whatever Virgo domain you kind of practice your expertise? I hope that this helps. Libra. If you are a Libra, then this Aries full moon eclipses. Uh, no, it's not eclipse, excuse me. This Aries full moon is happening in your seventh house of partnerships. So the seventh house is is not just our one-on-one -on -one partnerships. It's also the people that we work with on one-on-one -on -one basis, but it is also our open enemies, right? And so as a Libra, we can kind of take the um, celestial Aphrodite approach to our lives, meaning that we see ourselves in a kind of beautific and exalted way of kind of living in the rarefied air of the higher mind and not necessarily seeing ourselves as the kind of hand-to-hand -hand combatants that we actually are when we're in the seventh house, right? So air signs, I think, in general, although air does w so well with fire, right? It is the polarity point to you. Aries is your polarity point. So what repels you is also attractive to you. And this is the perfect opportunity to start incorporating that um, if you, you know, they say, if you spot it, you got it, right? So if there's something that's really ab abhorrent about another person, right? Um, this was definitely my experience with this, uh, Venus going through Scorpio, right? There was a person who was really niggling me and I had to really kind of take it to, because we're in Libra anyhow, what is this person showing me about myself? Right? Because I, everything that this person has is everything that's in me too, right? And so how am I denying that I do those things too? Yeah. And how can I kind of take that to the place of higher mind? But also, you know, take it to the, to the understanding that you inherited it from your parents and to see them as <sighs> hum, you know, right, divine creatures living a human life. And also to understand that they did the best that they could and we do the best that we can but if you spot it you got it and now you know that you can work with it too i hope that this helps scorpio if you are a scorpio then this aries full moon is happening for you in your sixth house so um just like with this chart, Scorpio, so this is an in conjunct, right? This is a quincunx. So for Aries to incorporate the Scorpio energy, it has to go to the square to Cancer, right? Which is inherently where we all are now, right? Because with Mars there, we're all being squared by this energy. So whatever the square is showing you about your, well, we'll flip it. So for an Aries, it goes to Cancer and then the can from that Cancer understanding, you can access the trine to the Scorpio energy. But as a Scorpio, you do the same thing, but you go from Scorpio to the square of Aquarius, right? Aquarius is the is the alpha and omega. It is the underworld for you, okay? The bigger picture of your kind of lived existence where you kind of hold it at arm's length. Well, it's time to kind of get up close and personal with it and to take responsibility for how your um, earliest um, understanding of self has created a situation where now you're kind of from Aquarius, it's a sextile to Aries. It's an opportunity, right? So you see how your family of origin created an opportunity for you to understand yourself through work, but also through your kind of daily existence. 
this um, understanding of the inconjunct is really useful because as a Mars ruled person, you can think to yourself, I'm always transforming. I'm always evolving. I'm always growing. Yes, this is absolutely true. But if you don't necessarily understand that you bring that Mars energy to your work environment or where you spend your time every day, that's what the sixth house is. It's a, a, but also too, it's the pain, right? It's the chronic situations that we, that we uh, have to live through, right? It's, it's, it, it's where we kind of are enslaved, right? So if you're bringing all of your Aries fight to work every single day, well, that can't possibly be, um, I suppose, a fair existence to you or to the people you are surrounded with, right? Because by kind of operating every day from the standpoint of Mars, of, of combat, right? You're, you're also kind of falling into one of the biggest pitfalls of being a Scorpio, which is control. Right? which is kind of living in a dead zone because you're so afraid to have anything change. Now is really the time to kind of own your power to say, on a daily level, every single day, I'm choosing to not take the pause, to not take the breath, to, un to not understand that happiness is my, is, is my responsibility, right? And to kind of restoke the fire of the mighty I am on a daily basis to things that you don't necessarily want to do, right? We don't, nobody wants to be in the sixth house because it's the work house, right? And we, nobody wants to work, not really. <laughs> but when you understand that you are your work, then you understand that you, no one's more motivated to do the work than you, right? Because it's gonna get you closer to the Taurus seventh house to the love and the understanding and the care and the quality and the the sensual pleasures that this world, well, that Venus is always calling to you, right? It always seems so far away and yet it's right there. The power is right there in your sixth house of how you live every day and how you work. Put the work into you, y'all. Absolutely worth it. I hope that this helps you. Sagittarius. If you are a Sagittarius, then uh, Aries is your fifth house. So depending on how you use your spark, right? Uh, depending on how you creatively express yourself, you could be um, really raising your children up or you could be eating them, right? Uh, this is the expression of eat your young. So um, for Sagittarius, right? Sagittarius is understand inherently that Jupiter is really the, the the principle of order that that the sun will rise in the east and set in the west and the sun will rise again right and so every day is kind of an evolution every day is building into something better that there's always something better on the horizon right Sagittarius is, can be um, accused of anywhere but here right I don't want to be right here I want to be off. I want to be on the adventure. And they can be kind of really bogged down by the mundane. And so when you think about Jupiter, your ruler, being in your seventh house, are you kind of using your fire, right? Your creative self-expression to do combat, um, verbal combat, or are you treating your partners as open enemies? It's a question to ask, right? Because it's been very difficult. You've had you've had Pluto in your second house of self-worth and value for 16 years. So you've been kind of harnessing your fire into a system, into um, an achievement, undoubtedly, right? That may have been very stifling and it might, may have kind of left you questioning what is it all worth, right? What can I, how could I possibly break out of this? And so, but that, that Jupiter and Gemini is, is trying to entice you, I suppose, with new ideas that maybe have been exposed to you before because Jupiter is retrograde. So it's about seeing the past, seeing the order of our lives and 
kind of ideas that we had rejected or people that we had rejected, they can come back around now. And where was, where were you maybe too afraid to pursue something that was really kind of meant for you? That really was the path to come into the divine energy, right? It really, it starts with kind of understanding how Pisces or the, the fundament with, with Saturn being in your fourth house, home and family of origin could have felt like a tempest. It could have felt so incredibly unstable in you, that you were kind of uh, battered by the, by the elemental forces of your family that possibly maybe you used your mighty I am of Aries to kind of start to earn, right? Lots of kids start earning uh, through sports, right? Or through school, they start to earn their parents' love and approval. But that also kind of sets them on a path where, it, you know, it, it kind of codifies their identity, right? So rather than kind of eating your young, how can you see that uh, how your your expression of the mighty I am in Aries in the fifth house of how you find joy maybe you're putting too much burden on your kids to provide that for you and you need to engage in kind of or if you don't have children what do you do to kind of stoke your creative spark right are you working too much which can very often be the case with Sag and Capricorn right two sides of the same coin Really, uh, Saturn is trying to show you these past patterns that you inherited from your family. They're not for you. And that you really should have been encouraged and supported with this fifth house of Aries to step into the I am that you are. And if that was not your case in the past, now is the time. Because time is fleeting for sure. And we are coming into a massive change next year. Use this time to kind of get back in touch with where, what did I love, right? What did I really love about myself or really love engaging with? And how can I connect that even in the smallest moments on a daily basis? Because happiness is an inside job and it really does start with you. I hope that this helps. Venus is coming. Venus is coming into your sign, okay? So it's going to get a little bit easier. But with Venus having been in Scorpio, you've probably been um, in this friction you know, think about maybe po possibly maternal issues. Okay? Take care. Okay. Capricorn. If you have a Capricorn, then this um, Aries, excuse me, this Aries full moon is happening um, at the bottom of your chart, right? It's happening at your, at the home base. Okay. It's the alpha and the omega. It's the beginning and the end, right? And so as a Capricorn, Maybe uh, maybe you were naturally timid and you in being kind of more aggressive was fearful to you. Or maybe your home life situation was, was aggressive. You were born into violence. Okay. And so you became even more kind of um, limited in your self-expression. Or, you know, conversely, maybe some uh, sexual energy yeah. might have seemed been perceived as filthy or dirty or because Aries is really closely tied to the scorpionic energy right and so Scorpio for you for sure is your uh, 11th house of friends groups associations and so where have you maybe kind of suppressed that Martian need to kind of conform to different groups or maybe um, become like a kind of uh, society of, um, I don't want to say misanthropes, but, you know, misery loves company. And so yeah. uh, being a Capricorn, you're already naturally yeah. battling your own Saturnine principles of keep, stay small, yeah. right? Be hidden. Um, don't show people yeah. your truest self. Don't, don't give away all your wisdom, right? Don't give away yourself. Yeah. Um, Capricorn is really, um, yeah. about, Yes, obviously hard work, but also legacy. And so it can seem like it's always very precarious uh, for you with Aries being your fourth house. But it's a, it's a, it's almost a time to kind of 
flip the script and rewrite your history. Do it now before Mars goes into retrograde or at least start thinking about it because when Mars goes into retrograde, all of the kind of hidden enemy, uh, open enemies of the seventh house uh, might become more passive aggressive and you might become even more muddled and confused about what's yours and what's theirs. Particularly with Libra being in the top of your chart. Take care. Aquarius, if you are an Aquarius, then this Aries uh, full moon is happening for you in your third house. This is the house of siblings, cousins, and neighbors. The third house is called the joy of the moon, and it's really about how you spend your day every day. It's about the rituals that you kind of incorporate into your understanding of yourself, right? This is how I get up in the morning. This is what I do. This is how I start my morning. This is how I engage with this person. This is how I engage with this person, and it's a very... Um, it's a, a, a mercurial house. The third house is a mercurial mm -hmm. house. So you can see kind of mm -hmm. Aries, the mighty I am, as something mm -hmm. of a commodity for other people, right? Or that mm -hmm. your own spark has kind of been something that you've traded mm -hmm. upon rather than cultivating it for yourself. Mm -hmm. Or maybe there was uh, issues with, with siblings and cousins where, mm -hmm. uh, or neighbors or your immediate environment where mm -hmm. you couldn't kind of rise to the occasion. Maybe you were the cannon fodder rather than being the hero or the poet. Maybe you were the Eve, the temptress and the one always to blame rather than being the Helen, being seen as the as the gift, right? Rather than seen as the epitome of all that's beautiful and gorgeousness. Now is the time that you can really address these feelings and change your mind. You've had Pluto moving through your 12th house so you've been forced for the last 16 years to really break down your patterns of cultivation, yes, but also thinking about uh, relationships with the father, how you meet your physical security outside in the world, how you, these are areas that we're all going to be looking to reform and revolutionize when Pluto moves into Aquarius. Mm -hmm. But you've had a kind of prolonged stay in in the kind of mental ward of your own mind. So no one is kind of better poised to lead this charge than Aquarians. But it's time to kind of get back in touch with your um, own divine spark of self. This is the full moon for you. Hopefully that Chironic wound has been eased a bit but don't forget where Chiron is that is the key to your immortality too I hope that this helps you Pisces if you are a Pisces then this Aries full moon is happening for you in your 12th house so everything no excuse me in your second house so Pisces is a very interesting sign. It can seem like you are kind of the man behind the curtain or the woman behind the curtain, right? Because you're a water sign, but you're using all of the elements at your disposal. But the way you direct your will may be with the second house being, yes, your self-esteem and self-worth, but also it is kind of the the house of control, how you control yourself and then how you control others. Um, if you go back to the Pluto story that I was telling in the last video, I said that I was being wrangled by a Pisces who was like Prospero in the Tempest, right? Calling on all the elemental forces to wrangle the Aries, right? And so um, that's a bad habit, right? Because ultimately you are the man in the arena and so rather than kind of diffusing your own power it's really time to step into it i hope that this helps this is jennifer swales from honeybee astrology until we connect again take care bye for now